Welcome to the Battle Buddy Podcast with Keith McKeever. Welcome back to another episode of the Battle Buddy Podcast. I got a great guest for you today. Uh, this guy wrote an extremely powerful book called Unbreakable. So without further ado, we've got Tom Shea. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Keith, for letting me come on. Appreciate it. I appreciate it. It's a like I just told you a few minutes ago, your book is 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 incredible. I listen to it off, you know, listening to it's a little easier than sitting down and reading it because you can multitask in a car, <laughs> but it's awesome. I'm glad you have an audio version, uh, by the way. Um, I've had a few people like, oh, I've got this book. And I'm like, please tell me there's an audio version, you know, because that's, yeah, prefer that. Anyway, I, I yeah. actually uh, don't, I don't think I've even read my book because I listen as well. So once it came to audio, I actually listened to my book the first time. <laughs> that must be really weird. Uh, experience it, it, yeah the guy got it spot on he's a uh voiceover guy from atlanta and uh he he read it re- rather well yeah no it's it you can definitely it's smooth uh it's great i've listened to a few over the years that have not exactly recorded the greatest yeah, but you, terrible. Know, <laughs> yep. you have that so uh you are um not only this book but you've got your company unbreakable leadership uh, scroll down at the bottom. I'll have in the show notes. Um, you're, you've got a podcast as well. You've got another book. Uh, but before we get into that, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, let's see. Uh, well, now my family, uh, we live in Greenville, South Carolina, and uh, we moved here or I retired about 10 years ago. And I'd been in the SEAL teams for 23 years and uh, had spent tons of time in combat. And and uh, my wife, Stacy had asked me to write down in 2009, which was about my 19th year, I guess, uh, what, what she wanted me to pass on to the kids in case I died in combat and, uh, ended up writing the book called unbreakable out of that, uh, the decision that she made for me that, uh, I rather she not made, uh, because writing is the, one of the hardest things you'll ever do ever, especially when it's about you. Cause it feels self-aggrandizing and you feel terrible telling all, all your stories to people. Uh, but, uh, I think it's a, I, I look at it as a way to pass on what fathers or soldiers and sailors or seals can pass on to their kids. And, uh, it, it was well received. Yeah. I think it's really interesting. That's what hit me like first of like, okay, this is a different format. It's not just, I mean, it's, it's chronological throughout your deployment but it ties in all these lessons and then, you know, things you're learning along the way. And I just found that just to be really interesting. Um, but some of the, some of the things you, you know, kind of talk about in there, the biggest one to me was internal dialogue. Mm. So <laughs> I think, I think just about every chapter kind of hits on your internal dialogue and your thought process and planning for missions, going on missions when, when shit gets tough on the missions. Mm. And, uh, you definitely had a few of those moments in there. Um, but I'm real curious about one thing. Have you ever met anybody who doesn't have an internal dialogue? No, I that's uh, that do, but or the don't. But well, I definitely you know, do. Gosh, think about you know if you're going to write a book, uh, any kind, and you had discussed that you're trying to write a real estate book, it's fun to write something about into somebody's world that everybody deals with. And one of the lessons I wanted the kids to learn because I knew they would have you know, and what I call internal dialogue is you, it's what you say to yourself, either externally or, or internally, if you understand that. So yeah. the thought process, some people call it mindset, but man, what you're saying to yourself is entirely in your control and everybody's saying something to themselves. You know what I mean? Everybody yeah. is saying this, dealing with internally thoughts, dealing with emotions, all that stuff. So when I decided to try to write down something that would be of value to my kids, I knew they would be dealing with things internally. And I, I really think the cornerstone of success is each individual's ability to kind of master how they deal with things internally, like what they say about things. Because once you say you're done, you're done. That's the truth about life. And you learn that in SEAL training is, We've tried to get people who quit SEAL training to come back. They can't do it because internally they've already shut down. Like you yeah, imagine even in a marriage or even in real estate, if you don't think you're going to sell, you're not going to sell. If you don't think the property's worth it, it's not. 
And you can't sell something that you don't either believe in or you said is uh, has some kind of metric or value to it. And that became the cornerstone of, of uh, what I call the business of being successful is that's an internal process and you can master it, but you got to pay attention to it. Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I know personally, you know, sometimes if you get stuck in it, hmm. negative rut, um, you know, other things in your life that you're not thinking of all seem to suffer. You know, yep. if you start going down that bad path, but you know, when things are going great and you're in a great mindset and you're just rolling along, things, things go good. Yep. And there's definitely something to that, but. And it know, can turn on a dime. Like you oh, can yeah. be having a good moment and then get down on yourself. And the next step is a bad step. So that come to find out what you're dealing with internally has a big impact on the external world. Absolutely. I'm sure you had to deal with that, that a lot too, with the, you know, with leading guys in combat. Yeah. Just to be <laughs> it's like, constant. All right. I see this guy over here. He's, you know, he's slipping. Like you can, you can see the signs, you know, like snap yep. out of it, jump back in here. You know, you need to be part of the team. Um, yep. Did you guys, well, did you guys ever have conversations about that? Oh, constantly. Like, well, so okay. you, you got to. Oops, you froze up there, Tom. We'll see if you come back here. There we go. Oh, sorry. Yep, it's all good. So a guy named Draper Kaufman in World War II, right before World War II, wrote the curriculum for SEAL training. And in the writing of it, he wanted people to kind of get over how they process things internally. So how he wrote it into, I guess, existence is I want people to be exposed to quitting. Because quitting happens inside. It doesn't happen outside. And so he put together the Hell Week curriculum so that the, the men at the time and now have to under, overcome their internal, what I call internal dialogue. So then go back to Hell Week. And in Hell Week, you get exposed to your demons, like not wanting to do something, somebody threatening to kill you. You feel like you're going to die. Are you going to listen to that? nonsense and quit because the only way out of seal training is you die or you quit. That's the deal. Either you quit and go on, do something else or you die or you make it through. So that maybe there's three options and people do die in training. People die in combat. They die in life. People quit all the time. It's the oh, most, yeah. it's the most prevalent skill set that anybody has and, and quitting is a skill. It's a skill set that people articulate and people get really strong at quitting, or you can learn how not to get strong at quitting. And the only way to deal with not quitting is stop listening to your bullshit inside. That's... She's never the <laughs> right woman. Or if she pisses me off, she's not the right wife. Your body never feels like it's the right body. You look in the mirror, it's either cool one day and on Tuesday, it's not cool. So that internal thing that's going on inside everybody you either stop listening to it and like how, how Draper put it is you guys have made a promise to be here and we're going to give you a thousand reasons to quit. So here's the deal. Here we go. <laughs> and the thousand reasons to quit happen inside your head. They don't happen externally. And that being the truth about life and everybody can gain a lot of value from understanding that the, that noise that is inside of your head isn't real and don't pay attention to it anymore. It's never helpful. Like there's never really a positive internal dialogue. It's just don't pay attention to it. Pay attention to what you promise to do. You know what I mean? Good point. Yeah. Good point. Like if you're going to sell a house a month, whatever your promise is to yourself or your family or whatever, go do that. Or you'll succumb to your internal dialogue the market's bad. Oh my God, the interest rates up. And that's your internal dialogue trying to convince yourself not to do it. And, uh, there's a great advantage that you, every man that makes it through hell week gets because he learns not to quit and not quitting is I'm not going to pay attention to what's going on in my head anymore. Yeah. You know, you kind of look for those opportunities or like, I know, uh, at one point in your book, uh, you, you very the beginning, your endurance, uh, story your endurance race mm -hmm. you know where you're just like look up next set of trees top of that hill 
you know, around that corner, you know, just kind of setting that benchmark, like it's achievable, it's attainable, it's right there. You're not going down that path of thinking that, yep. that I'm done. So, yep. So yeah, and what I got, I, I liked adventure racing because uh, y- your brain can't figure it out. <laughs> that doesn't surprise so me. Like, hey, I Keith, figure it out listening hey, to it. <laughs> it's like, hey, Keith, let's go run. Let's go do uh, a, a multi-sport race for 350 miles. Your brain goes, uh, you mean not an hour workout? No, we're going to be moving for about 10 days, and we'll sleep when we feel like it. What do you mean? Uh, and your brain can't figure it out. And so that became an endearing thing for me to do to start unraveling how I looked at things. How do you deal with the impossible things that you have to do? And like you said, go to the next tree. Okay, I'm done. All right, well, let's sit down here for a while until we can go to the next tree. And that method of being successful is, is very great. As long as you don't quit. The options are still that you'll make it. Not that not everybody's going to be successful, but if you quit, I guarantee it's not going to work. But if you keep staying in the game by not listening to the bullshit in your head, there's an option that it's going to work. Good point. Yeah, that was uh, that was uh, that was one heck of a story. I, I know as I was listening uh, listen to it, I was like, "Wow, that many miles, ten days." That's crazy. Yeah, you know, the the rowing, the biking, the, the, the almost slipping off a cliff, the the time you rolled in on bikes and all your crew was like, all your tires are all jacked up. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah like, we were done. Know. We were completely fried. And had somebody given me an out, I, I would have taken it. I'm like, yeah. I'm done. I, I don't talk to me. Let me go lay down. Don't say anything. And I went and laid down. And then when I woke up, my brain had kind of solved. Hey, let's just keep going. We'll quit then later. You get, then you got lucky with the food and water. I know you didn't get enough to continue that journey, but to help you on the guy, the team did quit and, you know, had a van come by in the middle of the nowhere, <laughs> we would have gotten into that van. I guarantee you, but you know, sometimes it's just luck, right? Yeah. <laughs> sometimes well, luckily well, back. If you're with great people, it also helps solve a lot of problems that you won't be able to solve by yourself. Had I been by myself, I would have turned around. Cause it doesn't make sense to continue hard things when you're by yourself and then, uh, the, obli- not the obligation, but the commitment to each other makes a big deal. And especially internally, like, yeah. man, I, this is stupid, but Hey, she's still in a good spot or he's still in a good spot. Let's, let's keep going and either support them or they support you. And it makes the internal process a lot easier. Good point. Well, in your case, they were all team members, right? Yeah, they, uh, that was the only race I did with all SEALs. And the race committee guy said uh, it usually has to be a, a you know a female male team. And we convinced him because we're stupid SEALs. Hey, can we just do it together? And and he said yes. But we got kicked out at the end anyway, so yeah. it's all cool. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, you know, you, you went really far and you pushed through more than, you know, how many, I think was, what did you say in there? It was like 50-something teams originally? Or something uh, like that? I think there were 58 on that one. Yeah. 58 or 52. Yeah. Yeah, and then your fight with the French all the way to the end, right? <laughs> I, I still fight with the French. It still goes on. <laughs> yeah. Man. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an incredible story. I, you know what, that could be almost a short story just in and of itself right there at the beginning of the book. Cause I was just, I told my wife a few times, I'm like, you're going to have to listen to this. Mm. I said, I, there's only a few people on this earth that could push themselves to go even half that distance, you know, and go through the things that you guys went through. So what, what I thought, what I found is funny is that everybody can like internally, when you start solving the internal problem, I, I guarantee you in a year, you and I could go do that. If we get physically and mentally ready over a year and we start doing things together and in, internally, you'll start saying, well, I, you know, I can go a mile. Cause all you have to do is process the next mile. Don't process 600 miles. I can go a mile. I can go a mile. I can go a mile. And then as you're training and working up to that, the training is not just physical. It's like what you just said yeah. at the beginning of it. You're like, oh, dude, I can't do this. Well, let's learn how to ride bikes. And then you start encouraging yourself. Oh, dude, I can ride a bike. And if it's a hard place, you just get off the bike. Like if your skills aren't good enough and okay, we can endure the cold. So you go do cold things together. 
yeah, I, I can do that. And so as you start encouraging the internal dialogue, uh, the possible becomes clearer. Like anybody can do it. It's just nobody really wants to do hard things. Uh, huh, yeah. Internally, they don't want to. Externally, <laughs> yeah. So. Well, yeah, you know, some people don't want to do hard things, but um, a race that big, that I don't know if hard uh, accurately describes that. That'd be hard. I, I, I tell you what, it's harder to run a marathon. Ooh. Is it really? Physically, wow. physically, like on your body, it's so much harder to run a marathon because it's so intense. There's no stopping. And you, the pain point. level is probably much higher on a marathon because I've read and ran several of them. The It's just a slow drip. It's like a, the death of a thousand cuts, which is the yeah, ultra ultra racing. You don't know it's painful, and then all of a sudden you can't move. You're like, oh, my God, what just happened? Uh, yeah, can, but it's, it's a different that. phenomenon. Because at different points, you're engaging different muscles. You're doing yeah. different activities. You got rest. You got food You know, at some points and stuff like that. So, um. Yeah, it's possible if you keep everything in the right mindset. Yep. I would agree with that. Agreed. Yeah. So because you kind of wrote this for your kids, another thing I was curious about, um, I know they were a little younger when you wrote it. It's been a few years. Mm -hmm. Have they have they read this or listened to it since? Yes. I'm curious uh, what their thoughts and opinions were of it. Yeah, my daughter, I have my oldest is a, a girl. And so my daughter, Autumn, is now an Apache pilot uh, stationed in Korea. And... Uh, she had a hard time reading it because she was kind of older when it happened. So every time she would read it, she would start crying and remember all the times I was gone. And, and my middle boy read it like four or five times and he's now going to Clemson. My youngest son chance is, uh, he can read it cause he doesn't recall it. It's just another book on the shelf uh, and he sense, reads it and yeah. goes, man, I didn't know you did all that stuff, dad. I'm like, it's because he was three, you know? So. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I don't think it really said in the book, but I, I, I picked up that he was really young Yeah, he was at young. that point. Yeah. Yeah. That was the, uh, he, uh, when he was born, I went to Iraq. So it was probably three months after he was born. I'd gone on a deployment and then I think he was two and a half or three when I went on the Afghanistan deployment. He doesn't wow. recall it. Of like, course I don't not. remember anything at three either, you know. Yeah, no. <laughs> Thank goodness, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. I don't think I don't think I'd want to remember all the way back that, that uh, far. Yeah, I, I can't recall four days ago, so it's uh, all good. You know, I say that all the time. I, I always tell people that <laughs> I don't even remember what happened yesterday. So yeah, absolutely. You know, if it wasn't in my calendar, I don't have someone to reference it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not on a list. So um another thing I, I was really curious about is the concept of Spartan woman mm. and your wife Stacy. Mm-hmm. Because I thought that was really fascinating, uh, especially what she kept saying to you about don't don't give up, don't give in. We need you here. You know how that kind of repetitive. Um, but I was just kind of curious if you could just explain to the yeah. audience anyway what a Spartan woman is and your relationship with Stacy. Yep. Well, so uh, the 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 original title of the book was called Spartan Woman, and the editor and publisher decided that the, it can't sell because they said. There's no, there's no audience for strong women. I'm like, what the hell there's gotta be. Cause the premise of the book was to teach my kids something of value. And if men don't learn that women have great value, then they're less. And the, one of the truths, even in the seal teams is if you don't have a powerful relationship at home, you're not going to be that good a, a, of a seal. The reason why there's an 80% divorce rate in the teams is because the shit that goes on at home gets overpowering. So the guys make a choice between having weak women or getting divorced. And it's not a great choice. I don't recommend divorce to anybody. It's probably the man's fault as well. I'm not saying the man is strong. <laughs> there's a lot but, of variables uh, in there, right? But so uh, strong women make strong men. Strong men don't make strong women. It's not that it's not the other way around. A really powerful woman will make a man stronger. Usually a strong man makes a recessive woman because they kind of push the woman down a little bit lower than they are. And so I wanted to bring that point out in as much clarity as I could to my kids that great women make great men. And the, and cause I had a divorce and 
during that time of the other relationship, I was definitely lesser. It's also a product of me being a douche wagon at the same time. But Stacy would not let me falter. And she actually wanted me to be a warrior. Like, hey, come home carrying your shield or on it. I don't care, but you're, you're going to war, go to war. Uh, we would love you home, but you're over there. Pay attention to what's going on. And she wanted to hear the stories. She wanted to hear the killing stories and the blood and all the guts. And it made it easy to be in a relationship with a woman who wants you to be the person that you are, so to speak. Like imagine trying to do real estate when your wife doesn't want you to do real estate. It makes yeah, that's major, pretty hard. Yeah. It makes it rough. So that's a, that's one of the major points of the book is uh, find a partner who wants you to be the best version of yourself. Yeah, I think that's really important on the relationship thing to, to, to be able to share. Oh, and communicate oh yeah. Communicate back and forth. And I will stand up and say I am definitely not the best at that, yep. but I try. Yep. You know, I know with my wife, you know, with my two deployments, I'm, I'm an open book. You know, I've shared stories with her. That I've only shared with uh, basically my stepdad and my mom, yep. you know, maybe, I think maybe a few with my sister, but you know, real tight, close knit group, you know, and it's yep. like you have to be able to have those conversations and be pretty, pretty candid and open. And I think a lot of people, a lot of guys don't, they don't it's still for years and it, yep. and it just affects the, that relationship and the next one and kids. It's and, also because the woman doesn't want to hear it. The woman doesn't, if the woman doesn't want to hear it, it's very hard. Like if you didn't want to hear what I was saying, it would be hard for me to speak into it. Not that you're a woman, but if the right, people yeah. around you don't want you to be you, they don't listen. So then you shut down. So it's not just the, the warriors issue at hand. Uh, but I found that dude, women, I've never seen a successful man that doesn't have a powerful woman. It's a guarantee. If that's, you're that's successful, a if you're a successful businessman, your wife is not horrible. It's a guarantee that at home you can, you can put money in the stock market that, that the woman at home wants you to be there doing the best that you can. All right. And, and it's supporting you wherever yep. she can, just like you yep. should be supporting her yep. and her endeavors and, you know, lifting each other up. And yeah, because I think that's one of the, one of, one of my, my views with the issues that we have in a veteran community, yeah. suicide, substance abuse, homelessness. Terrible. One of the major, one of the major factors in, in my opinion is personal relationships. hundred percent. Spouse, kids, parents, those kind of personal relationships. And boy, it's just one of many factors, but it tends to rear its, its head for a lot of people. Well, it's, you it's, know, while you're in your combat unit, everything is on the table. You even crying is not a big deal. Like people cry in combat. I don't care what anybody says. I've, I've cried in combat. I've never seen a seal go through uh, actual work, killing people. And then you come back from it. You're not stoic. Sometimes stoicism is after you've cried a hundred times, but you come back and you fall apart and it's easy to do that in front of your buddies. It's easy while you're in a combat unit to be either real or authentic or whatever that word is. And that's why while people are on active duty operating or functioning, there's not a lot of suicides. It's when they get isolated that the internal dialogue or the demons become real. Nobody understands yep. me. Nobody gets this. I'm never going to be connected again. Or they retire and get divorced. You better get that woman or man under wraps because those are two definitely suicidal things. Like when you leave your brothers after 20 years or, or you got injured and you're now out of the military and then you immediately get a divorce, that person needs to be brought under wing very quickly. Otherwise oh, yeah. they're going to get unfolded. Yeah. That's, that's another thing I've noticed besides personal relationships is lack of connection to the military and veteran community. And then, you know, financial problems, physical yeah. and mental health, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, do they have a job? And gainful employment, yeah. something, something to do. Those are the five factors, in my opinion, that 100%. are leading to these. And the more that are present in somebody, the more likely they're going to end up in one of those. You imagine getting all five of those problems. Now oh, I'm not with it. my brothers and sisters. I get a divorce. I don't have any money. I don't have a job, and I don't have any friends. Okay, that's a you're you're 
it's not going well, bro or sis. Oh, that's a you know, recipe it's, for it's, disaster. It's, it's a recipe for I don't know if it's suicide. I mean, that's a choice. That could be substance abuse. It but could you're, be yeah, you're, you're like, dude, I don't know, I don't fit in anymore. And then that internal dialogue that's going on really wants to manifest itself. Nobody understands me, so I, I isolate myself. And then in isolation, you get depressed. And the only way out of that is drugs or whatever stupid shit people do. And uh, it's catastrophic, but it can be unlearned. Like you can roll people yeah. back into life. Yeah, I would say for you know anybody who would be listening at any point in the future or watching, just start by going to some sort of veteran organization. I'm not saying you got to go back to wearing your BD, you know, BDU tops and you know whatever hat, but just be part of a, of a veteran culture. Yeah. I don't know if it's the VFW, the Legion, the uh, IAVA, or just a group yeah. of guys that meet for lunch on a Monday. Whatever it takes, just be yeah. part of it. You know, you start sharing stories and sh sharing experiences, and you realize that, hey, you know, this guy over here cares. Yeah. You know, that now you have a little connection. You know, maybe the second guy and the third guy, you know, you can build that back up. Well, you know, uh, even moving that, along to the uh, why seals are so lethal is because we understand that. So, uh, it's not, uh, lack of depression. It's the ability to be real with each other that makes, cause we've gone through all the same experiences. Everybody has to go through hell week. Even the officers, you fail all the time. So all my failures you can talk about because everybody else failed. Like the SEAL teams don't let you win. So it makes you communicate with each other. It makes you be real with each other. You have, you have a lot of down or bad times with each other. So that makes you a, a very cohesive unit. It's not winning that makes you cohesive. It's bad things that make you cohesive. You know, there's, you learn a lot from failure. Yeah. You learn from and you, you learn about yeah. you, you learn about them, you learn about your skill and, and, uh, and it, I wish businesses did that. Businesses want to win and not fail. And that's why it's hard to stay in a business because you're, if you make a mistake, you have to go away. In the SEAL teams, it's Monday for mistakes. We're going to make a mistake today, and then we're going to get better at that mistake on Tuesday, then make a mistake on Wednesday. And that way of living is, is a great way of living. Yeah, I know. I get... I've seen some businesses, small businesses that like launch and they have a ton of success and everything's going smooth. And then the floor drops out. Yeah. They didn't have any failures. They didn't have any bumps in the road, nothing to yeah. learn from, nothing to adapt and adjust and fix and look at differently. And it's uh it's kind of concerning. I've seen it a few times. It's a, yeah. the saying in the seal teams, it's uh it's easy to be a seal on a sunny day. But it ain't sunny anymore. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's going to be fun today. The sun's out, it's warm. And then, uh, it's catastrophic five minutes into it. So, uh, that I, I wish people would embrace that f you know, difficulty is the way forward. Ease is, is a terrible life. If Absolutely. you had everything you wanted, you wouldn't do anything. You that's, wouldn't get better. Point. Yeah. It, you wouldn't have any motivation to, yeah, you wouldn't There's gotta be something to motivate you. So, um, so your, 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 your business, your unbreakable leadership, it's kind of a coaching, coaching and mentorship thing. Uh, mm -hmm. is that, is that what I understand there? And you kind of teach on some, some to, uh, breakable tools, uh, like a focused yep. effort, emotional mastery, modeling, failure, Spartan woman, disruption and innovation. Yep. Um, any of well, those so we, I, I created a pro just by somebody asking me to teach leadership. Uh, so the, the unbreakable got me on the, the speaking circuit, much to my dismay <laughs> and, uh, did a bunch of speeches in 2014 and several leaders got together and said, Hey, we would like you to create a curriculum for us to go through so that we can learn what you're saying in the book. Cause a lot of, a lot of things in the book aren't like curriculum based. They're just, here's my experience of them. And, uh, so I put a, to put together a curriculum in 2014. And since then I've taught 478 leaders. It's a, a process that takes about 90 days to go through. And the process is learning how to better yourself in five areas. And these are the five areas everybody has in life. Your health matters. 
no matter where you are on the planet, your body matters. Your ability to continue to learn is the second area. The third area is your ability to do something that you value and get paid to do it. Like work. Work's not supposed to be hard. You're supposed to be interested in it at least 70% of the time. You should You're have supposed a to get money for it. For it and yeah, be compensated appropriately. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And uh, the fourth one is key relationships. An articulate way to find key relationships and maintain them and have them grow. And the fifth one is spiritual. So those five areas I've found to be very demonstrative in people's lives. And, and when you get them moving forward using the curriculum, you get really better at everything. And uh, so the curriculum is we teach a seminar probably every month and a half or two months. And uh, I just got back from one in Omaha. And uh, it's it works. It sucks to do, but it works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you're, you're changing people, though. You're giving yep. people tools to to better themselves, and you know, you never know where that message goes. Mm -hmm. If they learn and they master it, they may be able to give a little sprinkle of advice yep. to someone here and there. And you know, I, I kept, do my podcast that way. Like you know, you don't tons know of tons of presidents and companies. Married and in better relationships. So sometimes that's a big deal. And we've made a, people, a lot of people a lot of money by making them efficient at their work schedule. Well, that's and, awesome. Uh, and a healthy human being is a great person to be around. It's got to trickle down too, you know, relationships, yep. company, keeping the company afloat, you know, oh, keeping yeah. it going, all the people that work for them. And yep. Absolutely. So um, what I thought one of the interesting things in there is key relationships. Mm -hmm. I think that's really it's a big deal. Uh, big deal. I never thought so. When I first wrote the curriculum, I didn't think that relationships at home were actually learnable. So you know that you're like, hey, I, you know, I have to have a great relationship at home, but I don't. I didn't know if it was actually teachable and learnable. Do you know what I mean by that? It's kind of a hard conversation to have. Yeah. So after teaching twelve clients, I realized the biggest change in their outcome at work and in their health was the drain plug of a bad relationship at home. It was like there was energy draining out. So we started being in conversations about, all right, bro, what's going on at home? And I'm like, okay, well, let's just see if we can teach how to be a better, you know, partner and come to find out it can be learned. And it's just not even hard to apply. And everybody listening or watching, try to try this at home. <laughs> A lot of people say, hey, don't try this at home. So try this at home. To be in a successful relationship, like the core level of doing that is every day that ends in Y. So every day that the rest of your life, you can text it, you can email it. The first thing you do with your spouse or your lover, if you're not married, is listen to them. Like be a committed listener every day. Listen first. You got to listen first because that shows the other person they're more important than you. Second one is don't speak drama to people. Like if Stacy and I are talking, I may add drama later, but I listen committedly to her and she shares no drama. And then I share with her or speak to her with no drama. And she listens no matter what I'm saying for at least 10 minutes. All I really get is 10 with her. And then she's like, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> so Listen for 10 minutes, speak for 10 minutes, and then every day have intimacy with that person, not full on sex. I get what you, you mean. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Uh, Just be there in the moment with the person. Touch, whatever your love language is, women have different ones than men, and men have weird ones, and mine is that's touch. A, that's so. a whole different topic for a whole different day, trying to get those com compatible. Yeah. Well, it's not difficult. If she wants me to clean the house, that's what her love language is. Cool. I'm cleaning the house. And mine is physicality. So she gives me that and I give her whatever she wants that day for a short period of time, not the whole day. And <laughs> oh my God, it solves an inordinate amount of, of problems. People don't do that. They spend weeks not listening to their spouse. They don't even know them anymore. They think they know them. And then it then they are always, hey, fuck, I don't want to go to work. Oh my God, honey, I, I this sucks. And Keith's pissing me off at work. And so you, you share shit that you're not really committed to, but it's just drama and come to find out 
my third client hadn't had sex with his wife in three years. Dude, come on, bro. Get back. I don't care how old you are. There's got to be something there. And I'm not saying that that's the only way to do it, but if you're zero in the intimacy area, it's a, it's a drain plug of energy leaving the situation. And when it, those three simple things are on point, your relationship is moving forward. Guaranteed hundred percent of the time. That's deep. That is some good nuggets of information that and anybody can do that. It's very helpful. For, for anybody people. can do that. It's not it's something that I have to go to get a PhD to figure out. It's not nuclear fusion reactors. It's I can figure that out. Yeah, I know there's I know there's a few books on love languages. I'm sure mm-hmm. there's a ton of websites out there because every I think there's what five or six or something like yeah. that. I read that once, but you got to you do need to realize like where you are and what your spouse's is. Yeah. And I think there's something to like a secondary. You know, you mm-hmm. kind of got to figure all that out. And then I, I love your advice of like, you know, it only needs to be 10 or 15 minutes yeah. at, at the minimum every day. Cause I'm a big, I'm a big believer in consistency. Yes. The more consistent you can be at anything, the more successful you're going to be. You know, especially in real estate. <laughs> yeah. If you spend three weeks, not trying to sell, you can't pick it up on, you know, day 22. Yeah, you're absolutely simple, simple, like one movement, one movement, one. If you did 10 push ups a day for the rest of your life, you wouldn't worry about health. It's, that's what consistency does for human beings. But we spend too much time not being consistent. And then we do sprints and then we don't do anything <laughs> for 21 days. And then we do a sprint. I'm like, I'm, you're, you're killing yourself. Or if you're like me, I haven't worked out in a while and you do, and you're like, oh, that really hurt for a couple of days. You know, yeah, isn't then, it funny that when yeah, you're in the military, you're working out and complaining. And when you're not in the military, you're like, I don't want to work out, but man, I was really healthy in the military. Ah, what the hell? We don't figure that out. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. Uh, yes. And then the body just, you know, you gotta, yeah, be consistent and, and yep. work it out take it slow. You know, I read another book a long, long time ago, uh, Darren Hardy, um, um, called the compound effect. Yep. And that's what it really drove home for me. The consistency of this. It's today, tomorrow, the next day. And it just, it slowly builds steam and you may not see it, but eventually you'll wake up five years from now and you'll be like, wow, gosh, I've been doing it every day for five years. Yep. Consistent. Never missed a day. Look how much I've grown. Look how many more people I've met. Yep. Look where my relationship is now. And, and that was a really profound, you know, book for me too. Is like, that's. That was that's one of the, the mean things and great things about being a SEAL is every day you, sharpen your knife like man i don't want to oh god i gotta go do tactics today and you shoot so much that the gun doesn't even exist anymore and so that consistent approach to everything is you're never gonna never gonna learn how to do anything until you've done it a million times and it's too bad that people don't lead that in all their endeavors it's easier to be consistent it's just kind of it's a grind like you never feel like you're improving when you're consistent. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, on on Wednesday, you don't notice anything different than Monday. Uh, but like you said, at the end of the year, you're like, oh my God, I've gone 7,000 miles. Oh my, I didn't recognize it. And yeah, uh, it's amazing. yeah. That, that it is. It's, it's truly special. But yeah, it's, it's weird. You can't see it in the moment. It's all in the room. It's 2020, as they say. So it's, it's easy to look back on it and be like, wow, five years or three years or look where I've come. So, yep. and then uh, I also wanted to make, make sure that before we left here, we also highlighted, you do have a podcast as well. Mm-hmm. I listened to a couple of episodes. I can't remember who it was because it was before I started listening to the book. Okay. But uh, you should definitely, everybody should definitely go check it out. I'll have it in the show notes, but tell us a little bit about your, your podcast. Well, I, I uh, one of the, my clients asked me to begin a podcast and like we were talking offline when somebody asks you to do something, you're like, oh my God, please don't give me something more to do. <laughs> you know? So we uh, started a, a podcast called Unbreakable, which the title of the book. And uh, I get to interview great people. And I, sometimes I monologue about uh, topics that I think are, are relevant to everybody with the intent that, some, that people listening or watching me do my shenanigans uh, get some kind of value that they can use in their life. Absolutely. That's kind of the same philosophy I've had with my show here of like 
the topics vary so much, but every one of them, I want to educate or inspire veterans to, to sit up and say, Hey, I can do that. Or I can use that and, and better my life somehow, you know, inch forward, just, you know, add that consistency, yeah. something like that. So, um, you know, it's, uh, you said something about veterans. If you don't mind me saying something, uh, uh, every veteran has 200 plus years of experience trained into them. We have things that we learned in our MOS schools that was from the Revolutionary War. You know what I mean? Standing at attention yeah, didn't come from it. two years ago. It was Revolutionary War. Discipline is a 250-year-old process, and it's been passed down from generation to generation, even though when they pass it down to you, it sucks. <laughs> and that level of education and experience that every veteran has, I wish they would acknowledge that in themselves. There's not somebody who has spent more than two years in the military that is not more capable than somebody with a bachelor's degree. Guaranteed. Most of the, the leaders that I say that I interact with say they get more value from people who have been in the military than somebody with a bachelor's degree. Because the people in the military have skill set and they've articulated that. They know how to deal with teamwork. They know how to deal with leadership at a level that somebody with a you know a bachelor's in whatever hasn't ever applied. They've got it book smart, but they have never applied it. So all the veterans that are out there listening, you are more capable than you possibly could understand. Absolutely. I mean, we, all those skills, patience, discipline, yep. you know, but even to look at things from different angles, you know, yep. look, you look, we're used to looking at things at a tactical level. You are looking at operational level, strategic level, it's, it's easier for us than, you know, your counterparts, yep. you know, even when at 18, he got out at, at 22 and all of your buddies that went to high school, went to college, you could have four years of hands-on experience, all those soft skills and be able to look at things at each one of those different levels, yep. or at least some, to some degree anyway. And all your, all your high school classmates that went to college, all they know is what they read in a book. Yep. They so have no are, way to articulate what they learned until they get uh, experience and skills, which takes yeah. them another four years. Absolutely. And, and at which point you're ahead of them. I can't four. say that after 23 years, I'm smarter than businessmen that are, that have been in for 23 years. But we, I think people that actually make it to retirement understand the human far more than any businessman will ever know. What happens at the human level, the tactical level, uh, and business leaders don't get that aspect because once you start being successful in business, uh, you start having tiers of people working for you and you forget what it's like on the ground and in, in the military, you're on the ground all the time. Even if you're in the air force, you're still <laughs> dealing with the private trying to turn wrenches, so to speak. And leaders get too far removed from center that they, they forget the human equation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Tom, I, I man, you've given me a lot of nuggets in this one. So I appreciate it. There's a lot of value in here for people. I appreciate you being, being on the show and I highly encourage everybody who's listening or watching, go ahead over to your, to your show. I'll have your website, both books and the, and your podcast uh, in the show notes. So okay. people can find it there nice and easy. <laughs> <laughs> try and make it make it a shortcut for everybody so sure. uh i once again i appreciate you being on here and sharing with us well hey keith i appreciate you and keep doing it man good job all right. right there you go folks i hope you enjoyed that make sure you check out the show notes for all tom's links uh my podcast website is battlebuddypodcast.net go there check out information if you're struggling please call 988 press one or you can text 838 255